Hey guys, welcome to episode 57 of The Green Life. Today's episode is so special. I have an amazing guest, Dr. Debra Davis, and I'm really excited about talking to her. She's a PhD epidemiologist, toxicologist, and the founder of the Environmental Health Trust. If you don't know Dr. Davis, go on Google, check it out, because she is a powerhouse and a a woman that is really on a mission to educate people about the effects and dangers of wireless connections, our cell phones, radiations, and so on. And I really feel this is important to know, or founded, of course, in science. Now, before we get into the episode details, I really want to give a big shout out to Nama Wealth, the J2 juicer. You know I love my juicer, it's been powering the green life since last year. So if you are on the market for a new juicer, you wanna get the J2. It also comes with a 15 years warranty, and it, I promise you, it is the best investment you'll ever make for your health. Also, if you are really keen about moving the needle of your health from average to amazing, join the inner circle on my website. I have created this inner circle for women to come together with the intention of sharing all the knowledge I've acquired in 20 plus years that I've been interested in help. And of course, I've only been practicing for 10 years, but I really love what I do. I'm always learning and I really want to move help from what is considered good to actually amazing because we do deserve to thrive on this planet. So if you're a woman and you want support, this is the place for you. Go into the show notes and click on the link. Okay, back to the show. Dr. Davis is a powerhouse and she's really committed to sharing information about wireless devices. Why? She became super interested in this even more so when she became a grandmother 20 years ago and she has truly been working to understand what is the effect of cell phones on children. Now, you all know, and if you're a parent, we tend to give cell phones and tablets to our kids is not great and you learn why this is something you need to pay attention to and what the ways that you can move the needle on your safety on their safety is and really learn things that we should have been told but we haven't okay guys without further ado let's dive into this beautiful episode welcome dr davis dr davis thank you so much for joining me on the green life today such an honor to have you here how are you I'm fine, thanks, and thank you for the opportunity to talk with you and those who listen to you. My pleasure. So you have a very interesting journey. I have looked up your videos since about 2020, maybe 2019, I started getting more familiar with you because I was doing some research on EMFs and then 5G was in the talks. And of course, it became quite a polarizing issue in 2020. So I really wanted to find out what the facts were versus just noise. Um, But before we get there, I like for you to introduce yourself and talk about your journey getting into these specific issues about wireless, cell phones, and of course, the 4G 5G uh, technologies. Right. I'm, I'm Dr. Deborah Davis, uh, and I had a career in science for over 40 years and published over 220 technical articles, three popular books, and my last book was called Disconnect, The Truth About Cell Phone Radiation, and we're going to be issuing a new issue edition of it uh, by the middle of the summer. Nice. So I'm very delighted to talk with you, and hopefully we'll have an edition that can be shared in Portugal as well. I got interested in this issue about 18 years ago when my first grandchild was born. And he was a very smart little boy and could crawl over at nine months of age, find a phone that was turned off, turn it on and play a game. And he's now um, at Yale University and uh, he's very smart. But at the beginning, like any grandparent, I thought, wow, what a brilliant little baby. And he was. But then, because I'd been on the Centers for Disease Control Advisory Committee on lead poisoning, I understood the need to protect the young brain. And I knew that babies' brains more than double in the first two years of life. And I also understood the importance of protecting that brain because the skull is thinner, it contains more fluid. And I began to research what was known about cell phone radiation. And the more I looked, the more concerned I became. So uh, at that point, I had started Environmental Health Trust, and I was the director of the Center for Environmental Oncology of the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute. And my boss at the time, the associate chancellor, was Ronald Herberman, a wonderful man. 
And he looked at the same data that I was looking at. And we were all, always working late at night back then. And he said, you know, we should issue a warning to our staff about this. There's enough evidence here to let people know that <clears throat> they need to take precautions. So he issued a memo to the 3,000 members of the staff of the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute that advised people not to keep devices on their body, uh, to be aware that when cell signals are weak, they use more radiation, and so you should not use them uh, under that circumstance, and keep them far away uh, if you have to use them. And that generated a lot of uh, interest and a tremendous a lot of pushback from the industry, not surprisingly. Um, and I thought that we would be finished working on this in two years because the science was so clear in 2007 <laughs> that we would be able to make success on this issue. That's what I thought. And I was wrong. Um, <clears throat> so when I wrote my book, Disconnect, which was published in 2010, I did talk about um, efforts to suppress the science and specifically the war hyphen gaming strategy of the industry, which started in 1994 when they got word that there was a study by Henry Lai and Vijay Singh showing that cell phone radiation, which in 1994, there was not much of it at all, but that that radiation could damage the DNA inside the skull of the rat brain. And so the industry decided their response to that science would be to conduct war games. First, they went to NIH, which had sponsored the research of Lion Singh, <clears throat> and told them that they had committed scientific fraud, which is a serious, serious charge against a scientist. Then they went to the journal that had accepted their article for publication, and they said they should unaccept it. And then when all of this else failed, they mounted this public relations campaign to war game the science. Wow, I'm speechless. I'm speechless because I feel like this is something I know and I'm aware of, but it's people are just so not accepting of this truth. And <clears throat> they feel like if you're talking about these evidence and the experiences that you had, you're a conspiracy theorist. This has happened for the past two years and a half, three years, with every single discussion that we had, whether it was about the virus, the solutions, the 5G. And I well, just feel like fact, people are not critically thinking, right. you know? No, I, I would agree with you. But I think that um, the we have to clarify something. There is ample scientific evidence that microwave radiation from cell phones and other devices clearly can damage human health. Mm. It reduces sperm count. It reduces the quality of sperm. There's no debate about that. There really yeah. isn't. It also, in a recent Swiss report for, for a group of experts advising the Swiss government, they conclude <clears throat> that there's robust scientific evidence that cell phone radiation increases the production of reactive oxygen species. Now, why is that important? because reactive oxygen species are known to damage cells. They think of it like Pac-Man going in and knocking off electrons where, when they, where they can. And they are associated with an increase in a number of chronic degenerative diseases, hmm. including cancer, <clears throat> as well as neurodegenerative diseases. And of course, we now have growing evidence in children of things like headache and insomnia. Um, I am trained in toxicology and epidemiology. Mm -hmm. So it's important to understand toxicology, it has a goal of studying things in animals in order to predict effects in humans. Mm -hmm. And we use it to develop new drugs and we use it as well <clears throat> to understand the mechanisms and what are called the pharmacokinetics of drugs within the animal so that we can better develop things for humans. Now, this is the foundation of pharmacology, animal testing. And yet, when the U.S. National Toxicology Program, using the gold standard for testing, evaluated 
cell phone radiation in rats and mice and found clear evidence of cancer. Within the U.S. government itself, there was a lot of concern because there are those in the government that want only to push for more and more wireless. Yeah. And they do not understand that wireless is unsustainable because you will never meet all the demands. Anyone who has a household with five young adults in it trying to use wireless at the same time realizes <clears throat> you cannot meet that demand. The only way you meet demand is through a wired connection in your home directly to whatever device is bringing the signal <clears throat> into your home. Anything yeah. else is not going to work as well. Yeah, I agree. And it's uh, it's definitely safer as well to have wired. But it's funny how we actually moved here in Portugal 2019. And uh, when they came and do the put our, our Wi-Fi, they didn't really connect the wire. I mean, it's you would have to be quite close to the box uh, to put the wire in. There is no connection anywhere else, which is really interesting, right? Because they are so used to just doing wireless. Um, but it's just so easy to do this. You can, mm -hmm. wherever you have an electrical outlet, you can put a connection with an Ethernet connection. Yeah. And, and of course, it's best to do it when you're building the house, but you can retroactively do it as well. Okay, interesting. Good, good to know. Um, so your your experience, obviously, now is finding this information and coming across realities that are not accepted by governmental agencies, which obviously have interest. Well, some government agencies are beginning to understand this, and I would say that the French have a national agency that is devoted to understanding radiation, both mm -hmm. ionizing, which is X-rays, and non-ionizing, which of course is the microwave spectrum. And we now increasingly understand that both of these forms of radiation can damage DNA. Yeah. And the way that the ionizing radiation works is it's powerful enough to directly break the bonds of the double helix of our DNA. Mm. It can actually knock them apart. Non-ionizing doesn't work like that. It works by increasing reactive oxygen species and they in turn weaken membranes and they in turn can damage DNA. <clears throat> the evidence on DNA damage I mentioned was first developed by Lai and Singh in 1994 and has been recently reconfirmed by the U.S. National Toxicology Program, okay. as well as by the Reflex Project in Europe, which was led by um, Franz Edelkofer and Willem Moskeller uh, of Vienna, uh, which also showed DNA damage. So the evidence that we can have DNA damage is pretty compelling. And from my point of view, this, this means we need to try to reduce exposures. Mm. In addition, there are some people that are hypersensitive to this exposure, and we need to allow them to be able to function in, in society instead of forcing them to live as refugees from the modern world. Can you take me a little bit through hypersensitivity to these um, um, frequencies? How does how does it work? How is somebody that is sensitive to it, um, you know, reacts? How do, how do they react to it? Some of the common uh, reactions, and I should stress that we think this is five to 15% of the population. We don't know. Um, I say that all people react to electromagnetic fields. Some people feel it. Mm -hmm. And those that feel it will have migraines, rashes, um, and, and, and other uh, insomnia. Um, those are the, the most commonly reported. Um, but a feeling of brain fog uh, is often uh, associated with this as well. And for them, the, there are two solutions. One, of course, is to reduce exposure as, as much as possible. And we have a new paper coming out in about a week and a half, which the former director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, Linda Birnbaum, is an author of this paper. And so is the chairman of obstetrics and gynecology at Yale Medical School. Mm -hmm. And in that paper, we all call for the creation of low to no EMF zones in the healthcare setting, in daycare settings, et cetera. Mm -hmm. The French government issued warnings about reducing exposure in ch children's nurseries, as well as uh, calling for eliminating exposure to the abdomen of the adolescent and the pregnant woman. 
So there are some European countries that have taken some steps to try to reduce exposures and to recommend reducing exposures. They exist. But the recommendations, do they are they followed up by action? Because I feel like what is the next step, right? You know, that's a really important question. And I don't know the answer to that, but I'm encouraged by people like you with this interest. And there are some professors in your country that are also concerned about this, that we are making some headway. And France is one country, Belgium, Switzerland, and Israel have all issued advice in different forms to reduce exposures. Um, and in some cases, for example, in France, children are not permitted to use phones in school. Mm. Okay, and that's, 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 that has to be enforced by the schools. Yeah, that's a good step. Um, so that actually, that takes me to the next thing. So one of the, a lot of, the, of my audience and a lot of the people that I work with are women. A lot of them are mothers. And I have, you know, I get to see a little bit of the reality of their life through, of course, the lenses of social media. But a lot of the times I see um, kids holding phones or tablets. And this is something that is kind of normal. You see it all the time. Yes. So with the information that you just shared, I feel like we need to go a little bit deeper about what does what do these devices do for children and um, how could parents really, how, what do parents need to think about? Because I feel like a lot of the times, obviously the the phone, the tablet has become a substitute nanny uh, entertainment when you like your kid is really like hyperactive or there you go, protect the one you love. Yeah, that's a good. So for those of watching on, on uh, YouTube, we'll link also to the, uh, environmental trust that will have this uh, flyer. Okay, so not having the phone or the tablets on themselves. Um, so yeah, what do you, let's just give a little bit of a step by step to parents. What happens when your kid wants the phone? Like, what should be the the practical approach for a parent not to allow their children to be attached to these devices? Well, now I am a grandmother, so it's really a different experience because the parents are in charge. And the first thing we have to do is to work with the pediatricians so mm -hmm. that at every child wellness visit, the pediatrician asks about cell phone use. And, the, and we are working with the American Academy of Pediatrics, and they are recommending no screen time for children under 18 months and limited screen time with parental supervision only after that, not to hand the child the device, but to, but to use it, for example, to talk to grandma with the parent holding the device. Mm. Because these devices, especially the iPad and tablets, <clears throat> are tested at 20 centimeters away from the large adult male body phantom that is used to evaluate exposures. And they're only tested for six minutes of exposure to avoid heating at this 20 centimeter distance. So there is no way it's safe to give a small a device like this to a child to hold for long. It's just not. And we have to start working as we are now. Um, we were happy to work with the pediatricians in Portugal as well. And perhaps that's a connection that you can make um, <clears throat> with the American Academy with the Israeli and Indian Academy of Pediatrics and with others, pediatric uh, associations around the world, they are beginning to tell parents, avoid using these devices with the young child. The young brain more than doubles in the first two years of life. The skull is thinner. The absorption into the brain is higher. The absorption into the reproductive organs may have permanent effects for, for baby girls. And you need to take these basic precautions. The difficulty is <clears throat> that to the young developing brain, the cell phone and the iPad are addictive physiologically. Hmm. There's something called dopamine, which is increased with drugs, sex, rock and roll, cocaine, dopamine. It's the, it's the feel-good chemical in the brain. And it is also increased with uh, the stimulation of the images on the iPhone and the iPad. And 
we are concerned about this. And, and we figure that the most we can do is work with people like you to get this more broadly known on social media so that people understand that a phone is not a toy. It should not be given to children to distract them, as you said before, excellently, as a nanny. Uh, parents need to do something very basic that they're not doing as much nowadays. They need to talk to their infants and toddlers because that's how children learn to speak. Mm -hmm. When they start to babble and you babble back to them, they speak. And in our paper that will be published in about a week and a half, and you can find on our website soon, that paper had, talks about studies of technoference. It's a new mm -hmm. term. You can look at in the literature. Technoference refers to uh, the fact that children whose parents are constantly on their devices when they're with the child experience bad feelings themselves of disappointment and frustration because they're not getting the full attention that they need from their parents when they're infants and toddlers. And most interestingly, new studies show that those parents who are on their devices the most have young toddlers with delays in speech acquisition. Wow. Talk about interference, all right. So, yeah. um, so when it comes to the, this is very physiological, obviously we talked about the health and uh, of the of the development of the brain of a child. And I guess this really is applicable to adults as well, because I see a lot of cognitive cognitive de decline in adults too, because they are always on their phones and they have lost this capability of being, even socializing like they used to, you know, without having a phone on the table at a restaurant or without having even walking in the street without a phone. Um, so I feel like because they're very addictive, they can change our attitude uh, to life, really, uh, if we don't pay attention. So then mindfulness is really important when it comes to that. But aside from the cognitive effect of um, our devices, uh, what what happens when it comes to um, more of a physiological and biological health, right? So I know you have uh, worked on papers that had to do with cancer. So cancer and, and, um, and um, um, cell phones and uh, wireless. Can you take me a little bit through that? Because I feel like cancer is one of the biggest uh, issues that we're having in society. Uh, it's a true pandemic. And of course, it's one of those diseases that you can't really pinpoint what has given you cancer as such, but that I think is an accumulation of um, of things. And I feel that these interferences in energetics are a big part of it that people really don't think about. I think that's well said. And I would also say this, though. I don't think cancer is the most important problem. Uh, it's certainly one of the more worrisome ones. Uh, let me take a step back. As I said, Lyon Singh in 1994 showed that cell phone radiation could damage the DNA. So let's talk about what DNA does. DNA repairs cell damage by sending signals to cells to tell them to get fixed. As, uh, or sending signals to cells that are bad cells and telling them to die, called apoptosis. So if DNA is damaged, its capacity to repair damage throughout the body is impaired. If you are on your device at night before you go to bed, the blue light from the device, and it's not that you perceive the color blue, it's that it's one of the spectrums that come off these devices at night. That blue light interferes with production of melatonin. Melatonin is a natural hormone that we need to sleep in the dark. And when melatonin is interfered with, and you don't start to produce enough of it as you start to fall asleep, then you are disturbing the normal circadial rhythm of sleep. And that is one of the things that is really widespread with these devices. People are having trouble sleeping all over the world, yes, all sure. over the world. And, it's, and certainly if you wake up in the middle of the night and you have to check something, you are then disrupting the cycle in the brain where melatonin should be peaking at about 4 a.m. Mm -hmm. And the two uh, humans with the lowest natural levels of melatonin, you might guess, are the newborn baby. And as we start to age, by the time we are 60, 70, 80, we have almost as little melatonin then as we had when we were just born. 
So it's really important not to disturb your melatonin production. And that is some one of the things that this is, <clears throat> these, the light from these devices can interfere with. You never want to sleep with your device on or near you, of course. And just this last week, there was a report that the watches that are microwave enabled and Bluetooth enabled may interfere with implanted electronic devices such as insulin pumps and cardiac pacemakers. Wow. So, yeah. I can see that. Right? But you think about it. What is your heart? It is your natural pacemaker. Mm. So, so of course you should be protecting your heart. And that means no cell phones directly over the, over the chest in a man's shirt pocket. And it means generally being aware of keeping devices off the body. We say distance is your friend. Now, cancer has been studied in experimental animals. As I mentioned, pharmaceuticals rely on animal studies. These are controlled studies developed under paradigms that have been standardized for years. And when such a controlled study was conducted on cell phone radiation, it was confirmed that that radiation clearly increased cancer risks of a rare type of cancer, uh, rare types of tumors. <clears throat> and the same rare tumors have been found in those few human studies that have followed people for 10 years or more. Now, there are negative studies, including recently a Moby Kids study on children aged uh, 9 to 19 with brain tumors that did not find a statistically significant risk in especially including the younger children. But only 10% of the children in that study had used phones for 10 years. Yeah. So, of course, you're not going to find a risk. But the study was touted as proving that there was no risk. And it doesn't do that. In fact, it shows that the kids with the most exposure did have a statistically significant increased risk. So the question we really have to ask ourselves is, do we want to experiment on our children? Or should we not listen to the animals so that the animal research predicts harm? The human studies can only prove the past. Are we really so conceited and arrogant about our need for the technology that we're willing to risk the health of our children. That is what Environmental Health Trust is questioning. And that is why we have materials available on our website that people can download and copy that highlight the need not to expose our children to this kinds of radiation. Yeah, And we really hope that you will be able to share that message more broadly. We have YouTube videos um, that provide information on the different technologies. And what we can say is this, 3G and 4G, which remain the predominant technologies, uh, rely on antennas that mostly are on mountaintops or tall above buildings away from direct human contact. Mm. There is increasingly in the United States, we know that unfortunately the majority of urban antennas on top of buildings violate even the current FCC standards, which we believe are way too high. Mm. So there's no monitoring, there's no surveillance. Although in Israel and France, they have real-time online monitoring of radiation from antennas. And I believe if you work with Professor Hugo da Silva, you will be able to achieve that in Portugal as well. And that is what is needed. People have a right to know about how much radiation is emitted. You're making a very good point. Um, and I, before I I share what I've noticed, I'd like to ask you, you mentioned 3G and 4G, and there are some standards there, but we have seen the 5G are slightly different. They are much shorter range. They're very close to each other. And, and you can see the antennas are very almost at our level, like they are on trees or on posts in the streets. So they're not even on tall buildings or mountains. They're very, very close to humans. What, what does that mean for our health? As I said, distance is your friend. <clears throat> now, towers pose a risk only to those who live within the penumbra, the parabolic plume that towers emit. 
So in fact, sometimes the safest place to be might be under a tower directly because the parabolic, if you think of it like a large sort of donut that goes out in all directions, usually sloped about 30 degrees downward to the ground, your highest exposure might be 100 meters away. So <clears throat> it's not so simple, right? Um, so we have to be aware of the need to locate towers in places where there is the least human exposure. That's number one. Or to shield them, which can be done. Or to have them operate at the lowest power needed, which can also be done. And to cite them appropriately and never cite them on a school or nursery or any of those places where young children um, can be located. And again, in a number of countries, it is currently illegal to put a tower in a school. Yeah. Not in the United States or Canada. And I don't know about Portugal. Well, I don't know. I don't think it is illegal here, but I will have to double check. However, I know Switzerland, especially when 5G came out, they, they refused it. I know Belgium, as you actually mentioned, um, they definitely refused it. And I don't know if they did as a whole or just in certain places. But now you said we can shield or we can have lower frequency range or we can have, um, um, well, we, we can do these two things, right? Less power and shield it. But are those things done? That's the big question. Um, I don't know. I think that's an important question for you and uh, your colleagues who share your concerns to ask. And I think that um, young parents are really, really important allies, as are grandparents who start to see what can happen to children. You can go to YouTube and you can type in uh, baby five months crying iPad and you'll see a video that parents posted that they thought was funny of their baby crying when they took away the iPad. The baby's crying because it's become addicted to the device. Yeah. This is not a good thing for the developing brain. As I said before, you have to talk to the baby and you have to be fully present with the baby. Yeah. Believe me, it'll feel like your child's getting married tomorrow. That's what I felt like when my son and daughter got married. It seemed like it's all too quick. Yeah. And you need to take advantage of the short period of time that you have to sit and play with your children. Yeah. That's what you can do when they're young. And as they get older, they're a little bit less interested in you. And then you have to make sure that they have friends and an environment where they get outside to play and run around and experience the natural environment as much as possible. Yeah, totally. I mean, the, you, the funny thing is I obviously grew up in the eighties. So I was really lucky and I count my blessings that my first uh, computer wasn't even wireless. My first computer was in 1998 and it was a dial up. I still remember the noise and, um, and how slow it was. <laughs> so, you know, I only really got a cell phone that you couldn't do much but texting and calling in uh, 2002. So I, I just feel like I had this privilege of really having a childhood, which, which a lot of children don't have anymore because of what we mentioned before. Um, but, um, you know, you're right. Like the first responsibility, I think the, the mindset has to shift with, we can't just rely on government to make rules to save us. Cause that's never going to happen. There are too many interests and too many, um, you know, too many people that are controlling both sides of, um, you know, the, the, both sides of this issue where they make money, where they make policies and you can't have this conflict and, and be honest, it's too biased, but, uh, we have to be responsible for our actions. So as you said, parents need to be completely involved in their children's life by being present and also making sure that if they remember what it was like when you were a kid, where you didn't have the stuff in your hand, you still, you know, were quite operationally entertained. That's where you want to go back to. And I think this segues way into my next question. I know you, we are pressed for time, but the, um, you know, we talked about all the, the the very gloomy stuff and how we feel so powerless when we look at the issue, but there are things that people can do. So if you don't have a chance to say, uh, disconnect all the wireless in your, in your home, especially at night, uh, because you live in a block with people next to you have a broadband and they have their wireless on all the time. 
what are the things that people can do? So I know with um, on environmental trust, you have some um, brands that you recommend for shielding. Um, can you just take me through a couple of things that people should really consider having in their homes to protect themselves from EMF? Well, well, the first thing is to talk with your neighbors and make sure that they understand the kind of information we provide on our website, ehtrust.org. It's really quite simple and very straightforward. In fact, we just launched our healthy home tech part of our website, and it's full of good information about exactly what you can do to <clears throat> reduce your own exposures and make sure that your uh, bedrooms do not have routers in them. Make sure you sleep in the dark because darkness produces melatonin. And if you can't, because you're there's a light from outside that you can't control, put a sleep mask on. Frankly, I sleep with a sleep mask uh, routinely uh, because I travel um, at least a lot <clears throat> before the pandemic starting to, to travel again. Um, and I think that um, to the extent that you understand uh, the need to reduce your own exposure and to use your phone more as an answering machine, you can actually use your phone on Wi-Fi plugged into your computer. It will get messages and it will take some calls if you have it on airplane mode and Wi-Fi. Hmm. Airplane mode and Wi-Fi, you get less exposure than if you're getting the cellular exposure, which you get when you're not on airplane mode. So, <clears throat> you know, we have to recognize that these devices have positive functions in our society, particularly for emergency responses in, in medicine in the military. And I would like to see those devices restricted to those uses or limited to those uses. And certainly children should not have a phone, in my opinion, until they can drive a car and they have to learn how to do it responsibly. So we have encouraged practicing safe technology. Now it's safer technology because not, no technology is completely safe, mm -hmm. but we want our children to learn uh, how to use technology more safely and to keep it off their bodies. Um, we, and now, you, as you know, there's a whole line of clothing with pockets uh, <clears throat> for the chest or for the lower abdomen to put your phone in. <clears throat> I would say you can do that as long as the phone's turned off or on airplane mode and not Wi-Fi or Bluetooth on. Mm. Uh, so we need to do a better job of communicating this. And that's why I really do welcome uh, people like you trying to share the word with those who, who listen to your podcast. How yeah. many people? How many people do you think you have now? So the gen, I I get about six thousand a month. But then I just did an episode, especially with Doctor Moore's, and uh, we are we are at ten thousand in two weeks just from his his uh, platform. So quite a few people now, which is good. Doctor, that's Doctor Robert Morris. Yes. Yeah. Oh, great! I'm yeah. so glad to hear that. I'm yeah, really he's lovely. He's yes. such a wonderful man. He is. He is indeed. And uh, we've worked together for more than 30 years. Oh, fantastic. I didn't even know that. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it was meant to be, you see. <laughs> I think, yeah. yeah people what, did you talk, what did you talk with him? Did you talk about phones or mostly water? No, we phone? actually, we, we didn't talk about any of this. Well, we talked about a little bit of all of this, but we talked about the general holistic health. And, you know, he's very focused on the lymphatic system and detoxifying the body. And as he understands the lymphatic system more than anybody else. And I think when even, even when it comes to radiations and the lymphatic system, that's such an important uh, thing to evaluate. So uh, we, although we didn't go into EMF and uh, we didn't go into vi into vibrations as such, we went into a different, more more esoteric kind of discussion about that. Um, but I think it really ties in very well with this because at the same time, again, we are vibrational beings so the vibrations from our phone do interact with our own and um, it will cause issues. It will cause even things like, you know, <clears throat> depression. And um, so it's definitely something to, to consider. Yeah. Think about this. <clears throat> your heart and your brain use very, very, very low electromagnetic fields. Mm. Without the presence of an electromagnetic signal in the brain, that is death. And mm. the difference between life and death is not chemical, it's electrical. Mm -hmm. And so the idea 
that if we add more electrical exposure to our bodies, which we are doing now exponentially, that this should have no effect on our health. It makes no sense. Mm -hmm. And we know uh, that you can disturb heart rhythms. And we know from a recent uh, warning from the FDA that electronic devices can interfere with electronically implanted devices such as pacemakers or um, insulin pumps. So yeah. we need to pay more attention. And, and at the same time, it is certainly true these devices have positive roles, but therefore emergency response and in medical and military applications, I do not think it is healthy to give young children phones. And, and if they need help at some point, they need to call, turn to an adult anyhow. No child is so alone in the modern world that they need their own phone. And what happens, particularly with boys, is if you give them a phone that's connected to the internet, within a few hours, they'll get to pornography. Yes, <laughs> yes, no joke. And um, I, so you, you mentioned that now clothing is made with pockets to put this phone everywhere and that we should not have it on our bodies. Um, except I, when it's off. Except when it's off or airplane. Right. right. Of course. Um, what about these clothing that are EMF protective? Do they make any difference if somebody's wearing them and has a phone <clears throat> that is on, on themselves? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Uh, my concern, my concern about the clothing is this: Let's say you have a, a shirt that's EMF protected. They exist, all right. It is entirely possible to make a shirt that has uh, metal in the fabric that is soft and that will protect you. It, it's possible. But then the question I have is: So this part of your body is protected, mm -hmm. uh, your, your chest. But what about your head? Mm -hmm. And then. You know, uh, will the will the reflection of the signal come from your protective shirt up to your head? I don't know. If you had a baby sitting holding your baby while you're wearing a protective shirt, is the signal going to bounce into your baby? I don't know. So there's a, a lot I don't know. And I prefer to say we should lower all of our devices to the lowest level feasible. Let me tell you <clears throat> that the Chinese company Huawei years ago, produced a baby safe router. I don't know if you can find it anymore, but here's what the router did. It turned itself off when it wasn't in use. It woke up when somebody needed to use it, and it operated at the lowest power needed. Now, mm -hmm. I actually think all of our devices should work like that. Hmm. That's smart. So, Dr. Davis, I have one last question about wireless devices. Everybody is obsessed with these here set that are wireless now. So even though their phone might be across the room, they can still hear what they have playing on their phones from these <clears> things <throat> without connection. Are they as bad as I think they are for our brain? <laughs> uh, we have a, a video on our website that I want to make sure you can see. If you go to our website and search... Uh, video AirPods, you will find two videos that show you the amount of radiation that comes out of the AirPod when you take it out of the case <laughs> and it's going and then you put the AirPods in the ear and the sound of the radiation disappears. Mm -hmm. But the radiation has not stopped. That is just going into and through your head. So we discourage that entirely. And these never were tested because they didn't require any testing on those devices for their biological impact. And <clears throat> because they use Bluetooth, which is in fact a thousand times less on average than the cellular signal, it's going to be much weaker. But I'm very, very concerned about children that are starting to use these devices. They make them for children as young as age eight will use them throughout their lifetime, 70 years. And then I believe it's most likely by the time they reach their 60s, they will have problems with hearing, problems with vision, and possibly highly malignant rare brain tumors that are basically untreatable. And that is such a risk 
that I cannot imagine why any parent would willingly accept it. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, it's I just wonder... a question of getting the information out. You are using a wired headset. Mm -hmm. I am using a, wire, a wired computer that has a good um, microphone. Um, that is the safest, safest way to operate when it comes to this. And you have to ask yourself, you know, if if you have to have your device on all the time, really rethink that. Because when you have your device on all the time, you are allowing yourself to be interrupted. And it's very difficult to get something done when you're constantly in a state of emergency and interruption and thinking, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? I better pay attention. I got to listen all the time. And you have that watch that buzzes when you have a phone call. And it's we are constantly distracting ourselves. And as a result, we are subverting basic human communication. It's ironic that I'm using this system to talk about subverting communication. I would love to come to Portugal and meet you and talk with those who share your concerns because that kind of communication is being lost because yeah. we become so dependent on electronification of communication. And there's uh, several documentaries, one of which is called The Social Dilemma. And it explains <clears throat> that the software of these devices is programmed to make us need more likes and some of the comedians are starting to uh, spoof our great dependency on these devices and how people even would be in the middle of intimate exchanges with their partners and suddenly st get a call and say, wait, wait a minute, I got to stop this and yeah. get up from the bedroom to take. A it it's unbelievable the ways that people are allowing these devices to undermine our basic human communication. 100% agree with you. Um, does it make a difference if somebody is on a walk and wants to have a podcast to download the podcast so that the phone can be off so you can just listen to that? Is that okay? Absolutely. Download to your device, especially anything you have to share with your children, then put it on airplane mode and then listen or watch what, whatever you have looked at. That is the safer way to use this technology and safest would be to use it on a wired device. Yeah, of course. Brilliant. Well, I, I know we are pressed for time and you have to go. So I just wanted to thank you for all this wonderful information. And of course, all the links will be in, um, in the show notes to your wonderful association uh, or the uh, Environmental Health Trust and all the amazing research that is on it. It's, uh, I see that it, uh, it's amazing. I, I checked it out for the first time uh, four years ago, three years ago, and how much more there is on now that is very comprehensive. So I'm really happy to see this development because I, I really believe people need it. And um, I will definitely share this uh, already before we air the the, the episode in a, in a few weeks uh, on social media because I feel this is a conversation that has to start now. And of course, the invite to come to Portugal is of course there. So please do visit us and um, we, we can definitely make some things happen because I really feel this is a, it's a conversation that everybody, even if they don't care for their health, the way that, you know, I promote with nutrition and, and the lifestyle, that this is something everybody should know about because we all using these devices. I absolutely agree with you. And I'm so glad that you're doing this. And I want to give credit to Theodora Scarato, our executive director, who has been working on this tirelessly for, for many, many years. Mm. And our website, ehtrust.org, has lots of information. We're always looking for feedback and ways we can expand. So if you think of things that we need to do or to improve, please send us your ideas. And I say that to all of your listeners as well. We, we, our next frontier is to bring attention to the fact that electromagnetic fields can interfere with the honeybee, with pollinating insects, and with the growth of trees and plants. And, we, and that evidence, we have some now on our website, should be more persuasive to policymakers as they consider uh, whether and how and where 5G might go. We believe that 5G is a train wreck. Mm -hmm. We think that it is failing already because people are not willing to buy a 5G router, a 5G 
iPad, a 5G phone. It costs a lot more money. And it's not at all clear that the benefit is worth the cost. And people are voting with their pocketbooks in China. They're turning it off at night because it's not needed. And in fact, <clears throat> we can turn off our own routers at night. We can get routers that we can set them now, if you know how to go into your operating system, to work at the lowest power. But people, for that information, you can go to our website to find that and more. And I want to thank you very much for all that you're doing to bring attention to this issue. And yes, we concur. Healthy nutrition and a healthy lifestyle and getting outdoors is important. So thank you for all that you are doing as well. Thank you, Dr. David. It's such a pleasure talking to you. Bon dia. <laughs> bon dia. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Dr. Davis, and thank you everyone for staying on for this episode. I hope you had a lot of jaw-dropping moments as I had because there is so much to know and so little that has been shared by governments and even by institutions and also by our cell phone providers. So guys, uh, if you have children, this is a really important one to uh, pay attention to. So bookmark this episode as well as the links to the Environmental Health Trust. This website is powerful. They have a lot of roadmaps to staying safer and healthier using our devices, especially when it comes to kids. So please pay attention. And if you want to know more, just get in touch and I'll be happy to uh, point you in the right direction if you need any more details. Now, if you have loved this episode, as I loved recording it, make sure you share it, you review it, and you tell us what you think and what you want to hear more of. And if you have any more questions for Dr. Davis, let me know as well, because we could get her back here, especially talking perhaps about the environmental factors and about the bees and the effects of wireless connection on our beautiful, precious um, insects like bees that are truly connected to our lifeline and we have to make sure that we preserve. All right, I will see you next week. Thank you, bye.